Well, here we are in Genesis 2. This is the origin of marriage in uh, human society. Then the Lord said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field. Every Now, this when you get to 19, like from 19 to 21, it sounds like a diversion, but it isn't. It's part of the idea of marriage. You say, yeah, but he's talking about he's talking about cattle and birds. I mean, what's the pay attention to it because it has everything to do with marriage. Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was his name. If you go to a zoo today, they these names of all the critters you talk about, unless it's a new species they discovered. It comes from Adam, the elephant and all that stuff. The man gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field. That would be wild, not domestic. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Now, twice we've had that word. We've had this idea, the Lord has introduced us to a word, um, a helper suitable. I'm reading from the New American Standard. We had it in verse 18. Now we've got it in verse 20. So the Lord, that's, that's the key behind this passage. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. He slept. He took, he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord fashioned into, the, into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and then brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He named her. It was his part of his responsibility that we read in 19 and 20. For this reason, now there's a summary and this summary is going to be really important when we turn to Matthew 19. And Jesus talks about this. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother. Listen, he's looking ahead. This is a prophetic idea. Adam, Adam and Eve didn't have fathers and mothers. There's no fathers and mothers in the story. <laughs> no, no belly button. <laughs> For this reason, a man shall leave his father's mother. So you can see it's forecast. Would you agree with that? He's forecasting something into the human race. It's called marriage. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife. It, the King James says, leave and cleave. Use this word, and it means to join together. Join to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were unashamed. All right? Unashamed. So we're going to talk about that. But before we do that, hold your place and go with me to Matthew 19. Then we're going to have a word of prayer and get into our study on the origin of marriage. Uh, and why is prominent today. Now, people sometimes don't care that it's in the Bible and they go their own way and do their own thing. But God, God said that marriage is a very important institution. I'm in the ninth chapter, 19th chapter, and the Pharisees were quizzing him about a right for divorce. What biblical rights does the Bible talk about divorce? For example, in verse 3, the Pharisees asked him, testing him, is it lawful for man to divorce his wife for any reason? Now, my subject is not on divorce. My subject is getting married. And he answered, have you not read he who created them from the beginning, male and female? He's in Genesis, the first chapter, verse 27. And he said, now we're in Genesis 2.24, if you have a study Bible. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. See, that's right out of Genesis 2.24, isn't it? I just read it in Genesis 2.24. 
So Jesus is quoting that as, as something that is prevalent in the post-Diluvian period. We live in the, biblically, we live in the civilization after the flood and before the second coming of Christ. And so he talks about, talks about the marriage concept as a, as a biblical origin. Then he does something. In verse 6, that he didn't do it. Watch this now. I'm going to read the second chapter, verse 25. And the man and his wife were both, I'm going to read 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Watch what he did over in Matthew. In Matthew 19, 66. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Watch this now. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. See, that's not in the original text. That's not stated that way in Genesis 2.24. Right? Well, I mean, you can look at Genesis 2.24 and compare them. So what we call that is a newology. In other words, Jesus has told us something unique about marriage in our time period of human history. Let's look at these two again. Because Jesus believes in the origin of marriage, and he added a special newology, a new idea. Here it is in verse 24. I'm in Genesis. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, they shall become one flesh. Jesus, when he says that over in 19.6, and he's teaching on the subject of marriage and divorce, they are no longer two, one flesh, what therefore God, see, verse 5, then he comes back to verse 5 and verse 6, and he says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. They can become one flesh. They're no longer two, they're one. They're no longer two, but one. That's that's math. They are no longer two. They are one. No longer two, but one. Then he says something. He says, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. See that? Now, here, I got a couple points, I, of course, with that. First of all, did Jesus believe that the origin of marriage was Genesis 2? Yeah, he did. He quotes it. And then he adds something specifically to it because the subject was what? In Matthew 19, what was the subject? Divorce. Now, this word for separate is going to be interesting because it is the word that you get for divorce in it. So we're going to do a study on this after a word of prayer. I'm going to take you into the study of this. We're going to take a look at this because not only has the world not believed that the Bible is important about marriage, they just marry what they ever want, whatever they want to do and do whatever they want to do. They don't understand this. This is a divine institution. Marriage is a divine institution for humanity. And then it has some special ideas connected to it if you're a believer. Well, what about, what about separation? What about divorce? What about this? What about that? That becomes an issue for believers. And Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 7. Well, let's have a word of prayer and let's get into morning study. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how we operate our church service. We, we meet for two hours on Sunday morning because the people as a congregation wanted to... I, I as a pastor teacher for, for spiritual growth, I ask the people to give me three hours a week. So they give me one hour during the week. Uh, we'll talk about maybe adding some day, some night studies to that. And then they, I get two hours on Sunday. <laughs> so they give me two hours on Sunday and one hour during the week. I usually do it now. I do it out here on Tuesday for lunch. 
we call it lunch and learn. The ladies prepare meals and we invite people to come in and study with us on Tuesday. So we do a, a one hour, a one hour study on my end of it, one hour study on Tuesday. Then we do a two hour study on Sunday so that so many have children. It's tough to come back to an evening service and not fall out of a routine. Does that make sense to you? And so most of the people voted for us on that issue. Well, let's meet two hours straight. Now, we give you a break in between. <laughs> we give you a break. In between. We'll, we'll do 45 minutes here, and then we'll take a 15-minute break and come back to another 45. But if you want to know why we're kind of, it's kind of different. This is something we as a church believe in and have decided to do. We'll do two hours straight so we don't have to break up our Sunday and come back in the evening for another program. Your children do the same. We run the same program with the children uh, with you. So I, I, I wrote that up front because I have people that visit with us and they don't understand how our program works. <laughs> you meet two hours on Sunday? Yeah, because we don't come back. We don't come back Sunday night. So, and by the way, I, I we've been doing this for years and years, but I understand a lot of churches do that because they understood how difficult it is if you have a family, getting them ready for school the next. Well, anyhow, so that's up there. I, we, we put that down there for you to understand. Unger, when, when, uh, he's kind of a famous theologian. He wrote a great deal. Unger, when he wrote on the origin of marriage, this is what he said. He said, in all the Hebrew scripture, Old Testament, there is no single word for the estate of marriage. And there isn't. There's a word in the English, gamos, but not in the Hebrew. Or to express the abstract idea of wedlock. It's just kind of interesting. Now, most people don't pay attention to all that stuff. But a guy like Unger and myself, we think that's important. Um, have I had a work for her? Okay. I, th I thought my engine started... Let's have a word of prayer and now get in this study. Father, oh, hey, if you, if you, let me tell you what. We live in the church age. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's the great teacher of the word of God. He will teach the Bible to you and he will recall it. But he can't do it in, car in carnality or flesh. Evidence of that, personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. They have to be confessed prior to study if you're going to get anything out of this hour of study. If you want spiritual information, you're going to have to be under the ministry of the Spirit. Now, Father, we thank you for 1 John 1, 9 that says, If I confess my sin, or if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us through the blood of Christ. When we confess our sin as a believer, you forgive us. The extension of the work of Christ on the cross to the Christian life is confession of personal sin. And it restores us to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit and the teaching hour as well as the application hour in our life is very important. In other words, we learn it to live it. So we need it for learning and we need it for living, that same concept. I pray today, Father, as we look at the origin of marriage, you would teach us something significantly important to our life and to our marriage or to the future of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in point number one, and I, on your paper, everybody does it. Does everybody have a study guide? You'll probably need one. Okay, but we'll get you one if you don't have one. Uh, there's a there is a, a a special Hebrew phrase used by Moses for marriage, found in Genesis two twenty four. A special Hebrew phrase. He says. For this reason, in verse 24. Now, he's in a summary, 24 and 25. That's a summary for this reason. In other words, if you just jumped in at 24, you go, for this reason, what? Well, you'd have to go back to 18, where he's talking about the origin of marriage. Now, he's in a summary for this for this cause or for this reason, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, 
and they shall become one flesh. Notice three steps. Three steps. Leave your parental authority for marital authority. You leave and you cleave, and the two have to figure out how they're going to live together. That's where the difficulty comes out. <laughs> well, for me, the wedding ceremony was the difficulty, but for other people. So listen, here, here's what you have. Leave, cleave, and be joined together. Leave, cleave, and be joined together. Become one flesh. To become one, you leave your single status for a marital status for the two, for the two to become one. For the two people to become one. Listen, if you get married and stay two separate people, your marriage will not make it. If it does, somebody's a bully and the other cows down. There's no freedom that there should be in it. Two people have to become one. And marriage is the one thing that does that. You, so what you ought to start working on, you ought to be working on that while you're dating and while you're courting to see if you could buy into that program with the person you're going with. Wouldn't that be smart? All right. If you was in my position where you're all the time uh, counseling people who are upset and ready to bail or want to get a divorce, you would understand well, what happened up front. See, you got, you got to understand this. Leave, cleave, and become one. Leave, two, you got two, two singles have become, got to become one married. Two singles have to become one married. Two singles have to become one married. It's one plus one. Listen to me. One plus one equals one. It doesn't equal two. When you're single, when you're single one plus one equals two. When you're married, one plus one equals one. How do I know it? He just said it. The two become what? The two become... Now you say, well, you must have made that up. Nah, didn't make it up. That means leaving, cleaving to become one. Later... This idea in the book of Genesis, when they talk about getting married, they don't talk about it the same way. They talk about it from the man's standpoint of taking a wife. For example, taking a wife in Genesis 4.19, Lamech did it. In 6.2.11.29.20, I laid all these passages out. Later, when it actually, when people start doing it, it's called taking a wife. A taken a wife. Okay? Jesus refers to Genesis 2, 18 through 25, as the marriage passage, the origin of marriage. If you want to know about the order, well, who says, who says that marriage, uh, and who says I, well, the Bible does. If you're a believer, you should care about it. And if you're not a believer, then I understand your difficulty with this. But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is a big deal. And so Jesus refers to it in Matthew 19, 1 through 10, uh, or, or further reading, uh, when he was in a discussion with Pharisees on divorce. Then Jesus added, remember in 19, in Matthew 19, 6, he added what is called a newology, a new idea or concept. To Genesis, he, what therefore God has joined together, he said, let no man separate, because marriage is a union, one plus one equals one. Okay? Marriage and joined together, I put the Greek word there, it means to be yoked together. 
like in the old day, you harnessed two horses up to carry a wagon, to pull a wagon. You harnessed two, uh, two horses up. That's yoking. You had to yoke them. You had, and they had to work together as one. And so that's the concept. Okay. Now, let me let me let me tell you something else that's kind of interesting. In the Hebrew language, the word leave is a callum perfect. I'm just I'm going to explain something to you. It's kind of neat because you can't see it in English. That's the word cleave is a cow perfect, and the word become is a cow perfect. Now, let me tell you what that difference is. When you have an imperfect tense, it, it, it refers to incomplete. When you're, dealing with, when you're dealing with a perfect tense, you're dealing with something that's complete. Now watch this. Watch what he did. And, and boy, did he lay this out. He said, a man shall leave. He put it in the imperfect tense. In other words, this, at this point, the man and the woman are both single. One plus one equals two. And that's their process. That's their process in life until they get married. Then it's one plus one is one. Agreed? And he did it by showing you that when you are single, you're in the process of looking to get married. You're in a one, one plus one equals two. You, you're in charge of your own life. You can make your own decision. You can do what you want. When you get married, then it has to run through us, not me. It has to run through us. The me is no longer valuable in the sense of marriage. It's us. It's we. Well, look, so when you're single, one, one plus two, he put in the Calum perfect, the Hebrew idea of leave your father and your mother. That single status, I'm not married yet. Cleave is join is marriage. When you cleave or get married, he puts it in a cow perfect. That's a completed state. And becoming one is the name of the game. That's a cow perfect. Both of those are completed states. In other words, when you get married, this is the deal. One plus one is one. It is not two. Well, that's a biblical math. That's biblical math. Here's the second point. When you examine the t of when you examine original marriage, Genesis 2, 18 through 25, you find something really interesting. Watch this. Because when we were right through it, you didn't pay any attention to it. And that's